All right. So, Chris, we have been doing this is number 40. I just realized. Is it really? 40 episodes 40 of episodes BJJ then? and Bros. So, so Mazel if talk. You, Bros. When did this happen? What do you mean, Bros? You just said Bros. BJJ oh. and Bros. I'm sorry. BJJ and Bros. How many bad. deep are you in? <laughs> I'm a little lightheaded from trading. How about that? <laughs> did you? Oh, you have not replenished your glycogen stores or your. You're sort of shooting no, I have the not. hormetic effect of being, I have not had my dextrose yet. Yes, your your post workout shake. Yeah, exactly. I haven't done that. So, so you you actually eat fairly late if that's the case, right? Like Yeah, I mean it just it it comes down to the training, right? It's it's like, you know, if you get off the mats, you know, at eight, let's say, there's some cool down. We might be BSing over there. Let's say I get home by nine. It's still, I've got a shower. I've had this, you know, high intent, like hit workout essentially. And I find that I don't have an appetite right after an intense training session. Well, so I almost because, need some yeah. time. I need time to cool down. So yeah, I'll end up usually eating between 10 and 1130. Oh my God. Yeah, bro. I just, I think back to, you know, pre Connor days. So, or BC, right? BC in the life of, of Chris. Like I, I actually a Facebook memory popped up the other day, which reminded me, oh, Chris, this this was your life before having a child. And it was some post along the lines of like, oh, I, you know, I did jujitsu at six, Muay Thai at seven, home by eight, showered, cooking dinner at 845, eating dinner at 945 with my wife, who just also got home from her 12 hour day at, you know, being an auditor. This is normal, right? And I just think back, I'm like, man, I, I, I'm literally climbing into bed when I used to be cooking dinner. So, uh, how, how things change, I guess. Well, I think, you know, I think a lot of that just has to do with, you know, our training schedule. Like ideally yeah. I would be training at four or five and be home by six or seven just to make everything a little earlier, but. You know, I, I end up, I, you know, I'm, I'm like, as you know, I work from home, so I have the flexibility of not having to get up super early, right. unlike yourself. So I just skew a little later. But yeah, I think uh, anytime you can have your schedule in line with the sunrise and sunset yeah. of your area, I think you're probably better off. So it is what it is, yeah. but it, uh, you know, things are good. I had this uh, idea when I was driving back from training because this is something that actually uh, I was curious about and we never got into detail or we didn't go into depth about this. I've heard bits and pieces of this. You've brought up bits and pieces of it in our conversations across all our episodes, but you're building this up so much. I'm very, I know, I yeah. know you're, you're, you know, it's really just, it's really just a, a more comprehensive uh, walk through of your history going from taekwondo what got you involved with taekwondo and then that training experience and how that eventually <laughs> got you into you know, Thai and jiu-jitsu nobody wants to hear this though well i do okay i mean it's... i do and I, and I, and, I, and so i i'm just curious and you can go into as much detail as you as you want and i'll i'll stop you and ask questions but my question to you is what was your what is your earliest martial arts memory and what was the catalyst for it so my earliest martial arts memory was that i can remember like that you know not not just i i experienced in my lifetime but like you said actual memory it was so for those who don't know um i've always called it chinese new year since i was a kid mm -hmm. but evidently now the PC term for it is Lunar New Year because other uh, Asian cultures celebrate it as well. But that's the biggest holiday of the year for uh, many, many Asian countries. Including um, Vietnam. I'm, I'm including sure. Vietnam, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I, we, it was a, a, a Chinese New Year celebration and, you know, there was some cool martial arts school doing a demo up there, breaking boards, doing these forms, doing these amazing prearranged, uh, you know, step sparring, quote, self-defense, unquote, demonstrations and stuff. And it looked real awesome. So my, Where was this? Uh, it was it was either at 
ironically. What part of the country? Oh, it's, it's here here in Orlando. Oh, here in Orlando. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the 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 it was part of the Winter Park uh, Community Center, or or actually where Hawkers is now. That used to be like a little uh, rent rent the space sort of thing that the uh, Vietnamese community used to do. So either way, um, my dad got, got to talking with uh, that martial arts school owner. Um, his name is Mr. Fook, and he ended up, you know, later on, on, I think that was like a Saturday or something. And then on Sunday, my dad was like, hey, what did you think of what you saw? And I was like, yeah, yeah, that was awesome. Because I mean, like, you know, as an as an Asian American kid, especially, which is, it's kind of funny because like I'm actually listening to a lot of podcasts. I had just recently watched that Be Water documentary and just like the the odd sort of archetype that a lot of Asians feel they're sort of like lumped into is like being the martial arts guy, I guess. So I grew up watching a lot of martial arts movies, that sort of thing. Um, either way. So I was like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. And so how old were you at the time? 11. Okay. Fifth grade. Um, so my dad's like, Hey, so I signed you up for that gym. That's or uh, dojo studio, whatever. I, I just call everything a gym at this point, but I signed you up for them. They're actually within walking distance of our house. So this is the plan. You're going to do this. You know, I'm tired of you just sitting behind the TV after school and, and whatnot. Now, so, up until this point, you're 11 years old. Mm-hmm. You're in Central Florida. Were you active in any other sports? At not at time? all. I was super. I mean, as far as I can remember, not really. Like, I. I was just like a either a lazy kid. I don't know, man. Like I, I actually, I don't remember much about my like childhood, childhood other than just sort of very distinct and vivid memories here and there. But like, you know, I can tell you what I've been doing on a regular basis for the past ten years. You know, it's hard to do that as a child because I think as a child you just don't care as much. Right, like you just live well, every you, you year is it, every year is like a large uh, proportion of your life. Oh, it's it's a huge like amount of time. Yeah, but now you know, as as life has become a little bit more, I hate to say, mundane and routine. Um, things are just easier. Don't make me sad, Chris. Don't make me sad. <laughs> Don't make me sad about the accelerate of how time is is getting faster and faster. <laughs> Is advancing faster and faster as we get older. Don't it does let's not it, go there. I mean, it's, let's, it's let's not, not talk a, about the time dilation. Not an exaggeration <laughs> at all. But <laughs> so I, okay. I so you didn't do any sports. So we're okay. So what were you, um, for lack of a better term, were you like a little chubby as a kid? Oh yeah, that was to, to say that my dad had some sort of ulterior or did not have an ulterior motive would be lying. Um, because I mean, definitely, like I. I've always been a chubby kid. I mean, like, uh, I, I still am a chubby adult, right? So it's just, it's sort of, I think it's in my genes to a certain degree. You know, I, I'm, I know I'm capable of getting a lot leaner through intense dieting and intense exercise, but, you know, I might just kind of We've all seen that picture of you and Stacy. Yeah, the man. Model couple on the beach. That's what I'm saying, man. It's like I men's health that. and women's health, just right there. Um, but it, it, interestingly, postnatal, she's back to that, and I'm not. But such is life. Um, <laughs> the sympathy pounds didn't come off. <laughs> no, I mean, like, if I could lose seven more, I'd be good. I'm, I'm like, you know, post. I, I've <laughs> let's say I'm at 179 right now. I've I would okay. like to be about 172. Let's let's okay. put it that way. Fair enough. Um. So okay, so you're 11. I'm your 11. dad signs you up. He mm-hmm. may or may not have ulterior motives to get your maybe slightly lazy butt off. And the, I'm off the sofa. Man, like I, I trained a lot too. I mean, like as much as I love jujitsu now, I I loved taekwondo then. I mean, I was coming, I was walking there right after school because it was. So you fell in love with it from the get go. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. Like I was training three hours a night. You know, um like what walking there right after school. So from four to five would train once I was allowed to train in the intermediate classes from five to six and then six to seven. And I would just walk home, you know, um, so what it was, were those early classes like, 
Like, what were your early experiences on the map? What was that? For, do you remember, like, what it was like going in there the first day? I don't, man. I I really don't at all. I, I Maybe just the structure of the classes and whatnot were ingrained in me. But I'm always, I've always been pretty good at making myself feel at home, regardless of whatever situation it is. So, like, as kind of, like, tied into the gym as I am now, I think by maybe, like, late yellow belts, early green belts and stuff, I was pretty involved actively with the gym. I mean, hell, I was there three hours a night, you know? Like, it's hard not to learn a lot. Um, and I think that also might have a big part. It, it contributes quite a bit to my disdain for like hierarchy of position and rank in jujitsu or, you know, like I, I kind of, you've heard me say that before. Like I'm not any, I'm not any better at jujitsu than somebody who's like a white belt or blue belt. I've just been doing it longer, right? Like do they, they just need to put in the time and, and, and they'll be. So you're talking skilled. about the hierarchy when you say, cause you talk about hierarchy of positions all the time. When yeah, it yeah. Comes to that I was, yeah, that makes you're sense. You're talking about rank. rank. You're talking Surely about yeah. the social aspect of it. Yeah. And like right. the idea, especially now looking back that I should, <laughs> this sounds like so shitty of me and super arrogant, but like, just because somebody wears a higher belt than me, if they haven't put in the mat time and they don't, exhibit the same amount of skill and whatnot like what business do they have being a higher rank than me you know and this was this was obviously some sort of like preteen kind of like assholeness coming through too but i mean like hell i was putting in three i mean think about this way like as many hours as you're putting in now right for what three years of training getting there you know, let's say you put in three hours a day mm -hmm. or more realistically yeah like three hours a day right five days a week or are you asking me? Yeah, I'm asking you, you know. I, I mean, it's, yeah, five to six days a week. Is what five I'm to six for. days a week, right? Yeah. So that, let's say that's, the, 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 let, let's just say uh, five, just to be conservative. That's mm -hmm. 15 hours a week of training, basically. I was doing that at from the ages of 11 until like 16, 17. Okay. Or like consume my life. Like it's hard not to get better at something that you so you are very about. committed you are very committed to this at a young age yeah like I think some it kids speaks. some kids have a hard time committing to something to that degree well uh, you know i don't know what the percentage is but i know i mean some kids do a bunch of stuff and for you to be able to do three hours a day you know let's say five days a week over the course of what is that five years four to five years yeah like that that's massive when you think about the age you're doing that you know 11 to 15 is, yeah. is those are formative Very, years and each year like we just said before is, is like its own epic chapter in a book whereas the years now tend to maybe be <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe a couple pages in a, in, a, in a chapter you know how much of this so, did you talk about when you were on your your little hikes through the mountains about the compression of time and whatnot is well i always i always i mean i i always when i feel like time's advancing too much i, I like to go on a trip because it, <laughs> it slows time down but that that's that's a theory i have I, I i think time advances the perception of time advancing is inversely proportional to um the well, i want to get this right it has the, to do with the perceived the newness. experience. Or it something. has to do with the newness of the place. So, so for example, when you're a child, everything is new. Experiences are new. Therefore, time advances more slowly. I do think there's something to be said for the fact that time represents a much greater per percentage of your lifespan the younger you are. Yeah. But let's ignore that and let's just simply uh, talk about uh, newness. So... Everything you see is new that you experience as a kid. Therefore, in my according to my theory, time advances more slowly. As we get older, we get into a routine. Uh, time advances more quickly because everything is familiar. If we break that by going on a trip, let's say, suddenly time advances a lot more slowly because we're back to experiencing new things again. Hmm. So that's why I believe that if you go, let's say, on a weekend trip somewhere, 
that weekend is going to feel like two weeks because it's just everything you're doing is, you know, engaging your senses and it's just, it dilates. So hmm. I do think that if you want, if you feel like you're getting lost in like a, a in rut, the flow you might of say. the routine. Yeah. It's like, Hey man, take a break, go somewhere, go somewhere new and you'll, you'll do two things. You'll slow time down. You'll have new experiences and you'll appreciate what you have back home. So yeah. it's a win, win, win. So anyway, that, 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 that's a little divergent philosophy, but, uh, with you, I would imagine that at some point, uh, training Taekwondo for the period of time you're doing, given the commitment you were doing, and I'd imagine that commitment was, I'm sure there might've been other students that were doing it uh, that were as committed as you, but not all students. So Correct. I would think, I would think that a guy like you would be a prime candidate to be an assistant coach in some respect or given some sort of responsibility on the mat. Is that true? Did, did that happen over time that as did. a child? So maturing? as actually I started teaching classes, I didn't teach regular class as much. I didn't teach nearly as much as I do now. Um, but once I, so I trained, let's just clarify real quick. I trained, basically from the moment when I started college is when I really slowed down my jujitsu or my jujitsu, Jesus, um, my Taekwondo training. And also around the time where, because I started getting more into learning about MMA, right? Like, because that was the new big thing. It'd become a little more mainstream. I kind of got away from just like studying martial arts as much as I do now or then rather. Um, just, you know, everybody's sort of like an asshole when you're like 16, 17, 18, right? Because you're trying to figure yourself out. Everything that you used to do, you're too cool for, you know, like that whole deal. I stopped reading comics, incidentally, which I re-picked up again in college. Um, that sort of thing. And I, so I stopped training. Or I was very, very intermittent. I would just kind of stick my head in there every so often just to kind of, you know, get my hands dirty and, and kind of hone the, uh, the knife a little bit. But... Oh, after a little bit, my, I think my Taekwondo instructor, Mr. Vuk just wanted like a day off, kind of like how Paul needs a little weekend off here and so off, you know, sure. you know, <laughs> everybody does. He asked me to start teaching Friday evening classes, probably because it was just a little bit slower that day anyway, just like, and it gives him like a longer weekend. Exactly. So I'd started teaching that class around the same time I had rediscovered or discovered MMA and that sort of thing, actually incidentally from a highlight video of Kazushi Shakuraba because I had heard about some weird wrestler guy who had beaten a bunch of Gracie folks, right? And Gracies were these evil people in the eyes of basically every traditional martial artist because they were whipping the shit out of them. So I, I downloaded this video from SureDog.com back when it was some shitty little, you know, looks like it was made in Microsoft Word website. It had and, the old frames and everything. Yeah, it was so bad, um, I downloaded that and then they had a whole bunch of other videos too. Actually, I still have that saved to my computer to this day. The, uh, this Kazushi Sakuraba highlight done to you two's beautiful day, which is the, one of the best songs I could have chosen for that, for a, a, a guy like him. But he, uh, started watching that and studying a lot more in that and got into the idea of maybe I need to branch out beyond just doing Taekwondo because at that point I kind of saw the limitations of Taekwondo and I started I'm like, so what can I, what else can I learn? Right. I can, what, where can I, can I direct my skill set right now to something that's a little bit more alive? Um, and I, I found Kyokushin Karate, which I started like watching as much of that as I could because Kyokushin Karate is basically Taekwondo, right? Body punches kicks to the actually the taekwondo has no kicks to the leg but kyokushin has kicks to the leg body and head so very very similar tool sets let's say and through that i discovered muay thai as well and started sort of like self-teaching myself that uh and so just was, just 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 to give some context how old are we now at this point in time you're like 15, I'd have to 16? look back, man, but it was probably... No, 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 this is around the time when I started 
teaching Taekwondo on the Fridays. So it was like maybe 18 ish. 18 ish. So you're getting ready to go to college. Yes. I was, I was getting ready to go to college. Um, sort of kind of doing self study and all that other stuff, like this, the other striking arts that I found to be more practical and, and had some more aliveness to it, even though I, I didn't even know what aliveness was at the time. And through that, I, <laughs> I befriended actually my best friend now, Andrew, my sophomore year of college. I, I just became buddies. He and I are, you know, we're still best friends over 15 years later. You know, he had wrestled in high school and he was also into like Bruce Lee's philosophy and that sort of thing. We got to talking and turns out he had some more friends who wrestled in high school as well at UCF. So we all became, you know, I, I kind of like got assimilated into the group of friends, although he could never get me to do D and D because I, Chris Vu doesn't play any character very well other than Chris Vu. Um, <laughs> so you're kind of like Tom Cruise in that respect. How's that? Tom Cruise plays <laughs> so many different characters. Tom Cruise plays Tom Cruise in all his movies. Does he? <laughs> I would say that of Will Ferrell, but I'm not sure about Tom Cruise. Okay, well, that's that's my opinion. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll think, let that ruminate and we can come or, back. Or actually later. probably Vin Diesel is a probably better example, right? There are a lot of guys that are good examples of, of actors that just, of just play themselves. Yeah, they don't really you know break we out. We want to cast the actor's character, not... Uh, we we don't want to cast the character actor, but rather the character. Okay, of the yeah. Actor. So I, we, I don't know how it even happened, but somewhere along the lines, my dad ended up with this big. Oh God! Is it maybe like an eight by eight, maybe ten by ten wrestling mat that he might have bought from somebody for? I don't even know how much. Either way, so we I had that I had access to that. And actually, instantly, one of my friends who I still keep in contact with from Gracie Baja, uh, his name's Kevin Culp. He bought that mat off of me at some point. I think he still has it. But um, I had access to this wrestling mat, and we were all sort of like martial arts nerds who all had our weird sort of like experience in the different combat arts. So how did you find each other? It was, it was by way of Andrew. I mean, that was like, you know, like okay. he, his Matt, he, his actually who Matt, who Andrew and Matt, who I met in college and my buddy, Dan, who was one of their random roommates as what happens in college. Andrew and Matt went to high school and wrestled with Jason Patino, who is the owner no operator. Yeah. Owner operator of ATT East Orlando. So they're all from the same high school. They all wrestled together. Uh, I think, Matt will still remind me to tell Jason every time he sees him that uh, Matt teched him in some sort of like wrestling trial or some tournament or something. And <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it is. It's funny. Um, it's also very Matt. And um, sorry, I'm adjusting my mic here. So I had access to Matt. I think I just used Matt seven or eight times in the past 30 seconds. But I had ac access to the wrestling surface to which we basically rolled up and kept it in Andrew and Matt's apartment. And I had access to rooms in the UCF student union because I was the president of a club to which I would book. What quote, club were you the president of? I was the, I was the, the president of uh, Phi Beta Lambda, which was a, a business kind of fraternity i guess it was not really fraternity it was a, it was a club but it was a okay. business club it's actually where i met gotcha. my wife so she was the secretary and oh, scandalous very very much so i'll have to tell you that story <laughs> later on <laughs> funny what happens when you try to set up a girl with another kid in the club but end up marrying the girl um, oh yeah well, we gotta do a movie about this write a script oh yeah you know it's uh, sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction, but <laughs> so I had access to the student union cause I could just book a room in there w when they were available for free. And I would just put on, you know, it'd be like, you know, five beta Lambda s staff meeting or something, you know, and we would sit there and haul this fucking 200 pound wrestling mat 
through the student union, uh, through the utility elevators up every because because a wrestling mat is not like the mats we grapple on which are like individual squares it's something you just roll out yeah it's, it's, a, big roll. it's a big roll it's squishier mm-hmm. um it's very unwieldy it's 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 it's, just, it's very very hard to transport but fortunately andrew had this big ass f-350 lariat so he could we could just toss that in there and, and load it to the back to the utility elevator and 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 lug it up so so just to just to kind of summarize where we're at here because th- this is getting real interesting, and I haven't heard this. The part you're going over now is definitely new knowledge to me. I had some uh, bits and pieces of your Taekwondo background, but you you got introduced to Taekwondo around the age of 11. You instantly got into that, was training regularly, you know, three hours a day intensely. And by the time you get to 18, you're a young adult getting ready to head to college. You now have been exposed to more martial arts. You're exploring. You're doing self-discovery on that. You're finding things that make more sense to you in certain respects. And you're also connecting with other people that have similar interests in martial arts and or combat sports. Yeah, man. And now you guys are getting together and by hook or by crook using, you know, everyone's, you know, in college, most students, you know, we're, we're kind of poor in, in, in college, so where you guys are pooling your collective resources, access to a mat, access to a room, access to a truck that can move the, yeah. the, the mat and all this stuff. And you guys are getting together and messing around. Now, what are you guys, you, what are you guys training? What are you guys experimenting with? We're literally just sparring. And looking back, and I, I, I feel so bad to this day, like we we went and bought fucking goofy what atomics or awanu like grappling gloves and stuff because we we all watched UFC and stuff too. Um, so this is going to be early two thousands now, correct? Yeah, two thousand one, right around there. Okay. Yeah, because that's when that's when I was a sophomore in college. Two thousand one. Yeah, and I'm thinking and I'm thinking when that U two song "A Beautiful Day" came out. It was in the early two thousands, late nineties. Was it? There. Yeah. Great song, by the way. Oh yeah. The so we. Which is, we would just spar. We would just, you know, find a timer or something and just two guys square off and just beat the shit out of each other without much regard for each other's health and safety. Or So you're doing MMA. You're basically doing Valley Tudo. Yeah, it was stupid. Um, I, I actually, I, I didn't, we didn't know it until later on. Uh, I, I broke Matt's hand. I threw <laughs> what I thought was a leg kick which he did the dummy wrestler thing and like reached down to it and blocked it with like sort of like two open palms to which he like snapped like his fingers back and he couldn't move his hand for a little bit. And God, he's like a firefighter now. And he's like, Chris, you know, my hand still bugs me, right? Like it's terrible. Um, but yeah, we were, we were just beating the hell out of each other. And I realized at that point, I like, I need to learn grappling. I'm getting taken down by these guys who had wrestled for four years or whatever the case was at will. And they would hold me and, and just hold me there and not, nobody knew how to finish. Right. Cause nobody really knew submissions other than like grab a head and squeeze or, you know, there were no arm bars. There were kind of Kimura, you know, we, we kind of pieced things together and we didn't watch enough tape to be able to kind of like deconstruct things. So I went and bought, here it comes mastering jujitsu by Henzo Gracie written by ghost written by John Danaher. There we go. So we, we started studying that book. Um, it's where it was around what the Holy Bible. Ah! Yeah, that was the, it was my, uh, necromonicon. Did it have illustrations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have a copy, okay, man. I'll bring it. I'll bring it. I'll bring a copy. All right. We take a picture, take a picture of like what the, what a page looks like and put it up on the social media. Cause I think that'd be cool. It was, it's a like great it. book. Yeah. I, 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 it's, it's my introduction and it's my Bible for jujitsu. It's where I got my hierarchy positions and I'm sticking to it. Um, yeah, man. So we, we would sit there and we'd, we'd watch that or excuse me, read that and look through pictures and kind of like, you know, let's look at a Kimura, for example, how many steps are there to really set up a Kimura? So many, like they're just look at fucking Danaher's into the Kimura system in cases, right? Haven't gotten there yet, but Have, it's very good. But there, it's such a dynamic position slash submission that there is literally a, a system based around it. 
you know, we were trying to figure it out by a sequence of four photos, maybe five. And, and as far as we knew, that was the only thing a Kimura was. So either way, we were just beating the hell out of each other, uh, slowly learning grappling, continue to do that while also teaching Taekwondo on Fridays. Uh, and that went on for what, three years or so, just us beating the shit out of each other without any actual formal training. Like we didn't drill, you know, we weren't that smart. How did you come across that book? I don't know. I think it was either. So you had already seen, so you had already seen the UFC. So you were aware of what jujitsu was at this point. Yeah. And it was, well, here's the thing too. It was, it was a moderately priced book at the time. And there were other jujitsu books out like for example the the kid Pelagro books uh, that's that's a name that's probably so far beyond what you are familiar with but they were he was like the original gracie nut hugger and wrote okay. a bunch of instructional is books a, kurt pellegrino is that what you're saying no kid Pelagro. uh k-i-d okay. i'm not familiar with the name oh. yeah, yeah yeah he was probably like an early black belt or something from them so he just and he was partially responsible for documenting a lot of their stuff. I think he wrote, he might have written the Gracie way. Okay. Um so it, but but mastering jujitsu fortunately just happened to be the cheapest and also included punching, kicking and clinching. So it, 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 at, it, at it, what point were you exposed to, at what point did you become aware of of what Muay Thai was? Around the time I started studying, well first off the movie Kickboxer, right? Like uh, okay. Like that's that's so that was your independent like pursuits of other martial arts beyond Taekwondo you came across. Yeah, I mean we all love the Van Damme movie Kickboxer, and but there isn't a lot of a free and b very good uh, resources of information for Muay Thai. I mean there is now YouTube is incredible, right? And since then there have been a lot of really really good instructionals, but. At the time, it was just <laughs> adapting Taekwondo and, and limited Kyokushin to what you think Muay Thai is, which it's it's so much more than that, obviously. Mm -hmm. So either way, yeah, we, we sort of taught ourselves quasi. And then you got this book and, and, and you got the, this Henzo Gracie book mm -hmm. ghostwritten by john danaher which was like your holy bible the most amazing comb over in those by the way oh really? <laughs> before he just started shaving his head yeah oh so he was he, he was, was the uke the, he was the uke in the yeah. Oh, awesome yeah it's great. so and they're wearing like straight up like they're wearing actual surfer rash guards in there because like the market for rash guards and board shorts for grappling didn't exist so he's yes, wearing like an using... oaky, oakly, you know, rash guard and that sort of thing. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So that, I'll, that's I'll, I'll, I'll find, I'll dig it up. So this is, you're still in college. Do you start training jujitsu formally while you're in college or when you graduate? No. So I started, I joined Marcio's gym almost immediately after graduating college when I started grad school and had a full time job. Which was okay. what, 05, August or October of 05. Okay. And that's when I, that's when I met quite a few people, Paul included. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul was teaching you, right? Paul was one of the guys teaching you? Not quite, not quite. So I knew him at the time. In fact, mm -hmm. I, he was. So he was a brown belt. He was a purple belt. Oh my goodness! He was a purple. You knew belt. Paul as a purple belt. I did. He was a purple. Oh, belt. that's crazy. He got his brown belt very shortly before I got my blue belt. So he, yeah, yeah. He like I, I kind of mentioned before, he had his little like MMA group that would train in the back room. Mm -hmm. So okay, let's talk about customer service real quick. So when I joined <laughs> all the killers in the back, <laughs> yeah, th it was really weird. So I joined at the Korean school, which was, I think like iteration two of, of Marso Seamus Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And it was this weird, like sort of like strange setup that where it was like a, like a personal training studio and off to a side mat, there were like, 
like a long row of grappling mats with some heavy bags. So I joined there and it must have been a month, not even a month of training. And one day, me and my buddy who joined with me, shout out to Steve Nylon, we showed up to class and like we're nobody's there. Mats are gone. Everything's like we're like, what the fuck? So we're asking the guys who I guess sublet leased out that space to Marcio. We're like, what is going on here? Like, is there class somewhere? Like, did they just up and close or something? Like, oh no, no. They they moved. So we had to use every resource available. There wasn't excuse me. There wasn't really like Google at the time where I could just like Google somebody or Facebook. There was no social media. You could Alta Vista back then, bro. I think I might have been using web crawler. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. It was it was a cute name. And if you typed in uh L W E R web web crawl were, so like it would a porn site would pop up. They were pretty clever then. Yeah. You know, so we eventually found out they moved gyms to the place next to Colonial Photo and Hobby. And that's on 50 and 1792 out in the little Saigon area of town. And what? what oh, I know that area. It's close, kind of close to where I live. Yeah, what, it is. Mm-hmm. What made you choose Marcio's gym? I'm guessing in your mind you said, oh, I want to train jujitsu. Let me look for schools. Is that the that order was, of how That was literally it. It was, it's, so it was the only game Marcio? in town. It was the only available option at the mm-hmm. time. It was, it was so the Gracie only Baja was not in existence. Exactly. It was Marcio Simas Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So okay. I joined that. He, at the time, there was like this little weird back room that was matted in, and that's where the MMA guys trained. Mm-hmm. And I was taking, you know, quote, Marcio's class. Um, so were you training jujitsu and MMA or just uh, jujitsu? No, I think the MMA thing, I'd have to reach out to Paul to recollect, but I want to say that that was more of a, not invite only, but you kind of had to earn your way there. And Marcio had this policy that you couldn't train MMA until you were at least a blue belt in jujitsu and train like six months of Muay Thai or something. I, I'd have to... I remember there was some sort of strange stipulation where I couldn't do it basically. Gotcha. So I did jujitsu pretty intensively for the nine months or whatever it was. Um, How did it feel getting on the mats and training in an actual class with actual instructors coming from, you know, you rolling with your friends and, and learning techniques from a book? Like, did you feel like you had an upper hand on white belts? Did you feel like what what was compare and contrast the two experiences? So it was interesting because like I, in me taking a formal class, I think just coming from traditional martial arts in the first place, I had a good idea of, I had, or excuse me, an appreciation of the structure of class. Um, I didn't know exactly how it was going to run, but I, you know, you can reasonably kind of induce that there's going to be like a warm up period, a learning period, and like a live portion. Mm-hmm. Although in Taekwondo, there's far less of an actual live portion and more of like the learning portion. Um, the warm up was unlike anything I'd ever done. It was literally like 15 minutes straight of just like running in a circle and calisthenics and, you know, body weight stuff. <laughs> Oh yeah, old school baby. Yeah, yeah, old that's, that's where I definitely get that warm up. From. I love it. Um, and the idea, it's you know, it's I see why they would do that. I also see the downfalls of it because, and I don't know how much of this is just sort of rationalization, but some of it's probably sales tactic too. But I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. But it was the idea that if you're tired then and you're learning technique and by the time it is for sparring you don't have enough energy to use your attributes you have to use technique right you have you can't rely on your attributes at that point because you're tired out from fucking running around for 15 minutes you have to use the technique that you learned so i mean i can see that right but also if you're tired and you're learning a new skill 
you're potentially developing terrible habits, right? You're, you're training sloppy technique. So that, that's a major uh, a problem with using that method of learning. So I thought a lot of it was just to like weed soft people out. It was kind of like uh, we're tough and if you got to be tough if you want to stick around. Sort Which of I mean, th that's probably it too. And plus like it also, it's hard to deny if you're trying to sell jujitsu, right? And, and we've kind of discussed this before, like let's say 80% of the people that walk the door just want to get in shape. It's hard to deny that fucking 15 minutes straight of calisthenics is not, it, it, it's going to get you in shape whether you want to or not. Correct. But I don't think people that want to get in shape doing jujitsu want to get in shape doing calisthenics in a jujitsu class. They want to get in shape doing jujitsu. Otherwise right. they'd be doing a calisthenics class. So I think you still risk like turning away the people that want to get in shape because they're, they're in here precisely to avoid that type of uh, workout yeah. routine because they find it boring or monotonous, whatever, you know, they want to, they want to, you know, develop a, just the same reason people play pick up basketball or pick up soccer. You know what I mean? It's like they're playing a game. They're running around. They're getting all the, the same, you know, benefits and burning calories. But they, it's, uh, it's an exercise, a movement, it's an environment that's fun and it doesn't make them think that they're actually exercising. You know? This so. is true, and and that's an interesting thing is we should also distinguish between exercise and skill training and skill development, right? But people just sort of use Correct. anything that's physical activity synonymously, right? Like what I did this afternoon in lieu of doing jujitsu, I did strength and conditioning, which to me is exercise. Jujitsu, if done properly, is skill training and skill development and, and whatnot, but it has the side benefit of also being exercise right because you're using your muscles and stuff but i i did it's I, I agree with you that people tend to muddy the waters between activity versus exercise depending on the intensity of whatever it is they're doing which you just do is incredibly intense right so people just lump it in with exercise as well mm -hmm. absolutely so either way yeah 15 minutes of that uh eventually i get my blue belt which i've described before <laughs> it's not the most uh well i'm i'm just i wasn't sure if it was the best test of skill for somebody passing from <laughs> from white to blue belt how many uh, how, how long were the class were they an hour an hour and a half I don't remember. I think they were an hour, but I, I, I got sucked into doing what I did with Taekwondo where, you know, I was doing, you're doing multiple, what, classes, whatever, right? whatever I was allowed to, you know, and then gotcha. a, a, a couple times a week I would do jujitsu and then followed by Muay Thai or Muay Thai followed by jujitsu, you know, because so I wasn't I don't allowed in the blue belt class. Or okay, the yeah, I, I got you. you. You're limited by the yeah, the by the, what I was allowed to the actually entrance do. Entrance criteria for the different. But class. I would do so, Brian Bumbinski's competition class on Friday evenings because those that seems to be the only day that you know weirdo psychopathic serious people train. <laughs> as with all gyms, is on a Friday, right? Because everybody else wants to to start their weekend. And I was doing that class too, and that I think that one might have been an hour and a half, and that was pretty intense. I watched a lot of injuries happen during that class. Not fortunately, not to myself, but to other so people. So, ju just just to go back to an earlier question, uh, and if if you if you did fully answer it, then just say so. But I feel like there was more there's more left unsaid that that could be covered. I asked, what was it like with the experience of oh okay rolling with your friends and having exposure to the the not Hickson, but Henzo Gracie book. Did you feel like you had an upper hand going into class? You said you were familiar with yes. the structure. Yeah, it would be the equivalent arts. to a guy who watches MMA very vigorously, right? And then the first time they take like a jujitsu class, 
they have a good idea of like what a lot of the movements are. They can recognize but they're it. They're unaware of the details so much. Exactly. And so it's almost it's like addictive. Point. You're like, ooh, look at how the, you do the grip for the Kamor and this and that. You yeah, and setups where- and that sort of thing. You you know what the end result is, but you don't know how to get there, right? And I actually Jensen. Um, have you met Jensen before? Jensen Vega. He looks like so. a. Uh, he's he's a black belt. He was a purple. Actually, he was a blue belt at the time. And uh, Fabian Reyes was the purple belt at the time. The first class I took because I had already had some experience with that book and, you know, bullshit training with my buddies. There's the armbar drill, like the, just the normal swinging armbar drill, right? Like you, where you, you kick one leg, you use the momentum and you shoot your hips up high, you know, that drill, I could do that so well, because as far as I knew, that's how you do an armbar. That's how you don't set it up the way we know setups now is they're, they're, you know, as many different ways to set up an arm bar as our people. I just knew that according to this book, this is the, these are the mechanics of the arm bar. So I could do that drill. No problem. Right. And Jensen was like, man, like you do that really well. Have you trained before? I was like, no, I just read a book. So like I had a good idea of the necessary learning the gross motor movements to be able to help me along with my jujitsu career. Did they actually, random question, did they describe shrimping at, at, to any degree in the book? Yes, and I knew how to shrimp. The, all the gross motor movements I knew how to do. Um, they okay. don't, like the, the idea of like a power shrimp or the actual hip escape, it, 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 not, not so much. But okay. definitely, yeah, like they didn't differentiate between a power shrimp and a regular shrimp or a uh, hell like a technical get up. They, they, they're big on that because it was an MMA based book. Uh, the arm bar drill, you know, like just that sort of thing. Um, and the book had to do with jujitsu without a gi. Cause you said they were in, in rash guards and board shorts, correct? Yeah, correct. They, they differentiated jujitsu as jujitsu and not jujitsu, right? And that, that little I between the J and the U makes a huge difference. So Danaher wrote this book, excuse me, Henzo wrote this book uh, as a as, as his manifesto for Japanese jujitsu and how to train it alive. He, this is a, the first third of the book is, is history alone. So, And you're saying they're spelling jujitsu just J-U? J-U-J-U. T S U Jujutsu. Oh, I didn't know. So that's funny because when I first would spell jujitsu, I wrote it that way. And then I saw that everyone wrote it the other way with the I U. I I want to say academia, if you want to call it that, has gotten away from referring to Japanese jujitsu with the eyes. And they mainly use it with the J Jujutsu. And then Whoa. the I you blew my mind with this. I think ju- I thought I was just spelling it wrong. I think Jujitsu is a dis- very Brazilian thing. Whoa. I think all right, so don't, don't I mean all it's, right, it's all speculation. I'm gonna have to explore this. I'm gonna have to explore this a little more. Okay, so we've gotten you Almost to what I would call the contemporary era of your training. Yeah. Obviously, you know, you're at Marcio's. You're going to move around to various gyms. Uh, ultimately, now training out of ATT Orlando, where I've met you and where you now both train and teach on occasion. So w- what I am curious about, just at a high macro level, is starting at Marcio's and going to wherever you think is appropriate now, because I know, I kind of know what your routine is now. Tell me how your training routine evolved. And obviously a lot of it had to do with, you know, your personal relationships, your job, having a child, you know, that's going to, that's that's super contemporary though, right? Uh, No, I know that. So I'm kind of curious, like from white to blue, blue to purple to brown and now to black, um, how often were you training and, when did things change as life changed? Hmm. So white Just to at blue, a macro level. 
macro level white to blue that was so immediately when I got my blue belt, I basically stopped training jujitsu for a good amount of time. <laughs> you got the blue belt blues, man. No, no, no. I mean, like, so I was like, ah, you know, mo- most, and mind you, it was only like nine, ten months or whatever the case was. I got that then, and then I just started so how, doing how often were you training at Marcio's when you were white belt? Oh, like every day, except Saturday. Every day? Every day. Like Okay, so five you were away. maintaining that that same, like, that same cadence that you were mm-hmm. doing I, I when think you were I totally. I have a very addictive personality, but with the ability to recognize when something is self-destructive versus not. Otherwise I'd probably be a meth head or something, you know? So I just happened to direct my energy and you compulsive thing. You, yeah. So like, that's, I think that's where that comes from. Okay. So you're training super regularly, multiple hours a day, fi- at least five days a week. You get your blue belt, you disappear because you're weird. Well, no, no, why I don't disappear. disappear. I'm, I'm still there every day. But I, I devoted my time at that point to Muay Thai. Okay. I'm, I'm training as many hours as I was doing jiu-jitsu, just doing Muay Thai instead. Okay, so now you focus on a different mm-hmm. art. Your, your attention shifted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, you know, that's, that's how I was actually – I'm, I'm kind of glad I did because that's how I'd be where I am now. You know, I, I was training so, so much in Muay Thai. I became pretty good at it. Uh, to the same capacity that I, I'm sort of with Paul now, is where you know Bobby trusted Alistair and me and and Morrow and a couple other folks to sort of like lead classes if we needed to, you know, to mm-hmm. to be the dude to stick with new people and that sort of thing. And when Bobby, at that point, Paul and Luigi, Seth, Ben. You know, all those folks had left to start knockout fitness for I don't exactly know how long I'd have to see. I continued doing Muay Thai until basically Bobby got hired by Paul to be the Muay Thai coach at the now ATT Orlando. And Bobby's like, Yeah, yeah, you could I'll I'll come, but just you know, these guys are, are taken care of. They're my white right hand men. I'm bringing them with me. So we all came to ATT Orlando at that point. Gotcha. Yeah. So that's 08? July 08, I think it was. Do you think you can, do you think one can train Jiu Jitsu and Muay Thai equally hard at the same time? Or do you think there's not enough time, not enough mental energy, attention to do that? That's a, and you have to almost, that's a loaded like, question. Though. I mean, like, as with most answers, I think the answers, predicated on the individual based upon their time availability based upon their fitness level and their dedication i mean okay because i've heard for us hobby say you just have to do both it's like if you want to be and this from the context if, if you want to be a complete mma fighter i i you can focus them. on one and then after mastering one you do the others like you just you can't you'll spend too much time preparing and you'll be past your prime uh once you have the knowledge you have to do both it's just it's a matter of like picking your battles too right like can you focus on the sort of minutia of muay thai no can you focus on the minutia of jujitsu no you just have to do the 80 20 rule right like do 80 percent of the stuff that's gonna or 20 percent that's gonna achieve the 80 percent of the results right Mm -hmm. and that goes across the board you know you can't you can't become a fucking crossfit athlete and expect to compete in the games and whatnot either Right, you just have to use CrossFit or or whatever your strength and tra- conditioning protocol is to supplement your Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu and wrestling and boxing and whatnot. So, at what point would you say your training, uh, the regularity of your training, took a hit, for lack of a better term? At what level in your Jiu Jitsu was it a purple or brown that? Brown belt, that yeah, yeah, that, brown that, belt. definitely, and brown that that cor- and that cor- that correlates directly with with Connor. with my little dude. Yep, the best with, thing to happen to Stacy me ever. Yeah, no, yeah, we're yeah, not. No, no, we're not getting this. But, I, but, you know, yeah, like, we're not. I mean, that's obvious. That, that that's totally obvious. So up until that point, you were still training four or five days. A oh week, yeah, man, multiple like, hours. I mean, a that's day. when you saw me. You know, I was training, or or 
it was probably close to the time when I had Connor, right? I don't think I had. So Connor that's yet. the thing. So you, Connor is how old now? He he'll be three next month. He'll be three next month. So in actuality, I started training right after Connor was born. Really? Because I've been training jujitsu for uh, under three three years. I've been training. Okay, for so like, you don't know the balls to the walkers. I don't know. I don't know. You were just uh, becoming a dad. So in actuality, you were probably around the least. Yeah. Uh, when I first started, because you're dealing with a newborn. Yeah, yeah. That's when that, I mean so I stopped I, training for a month or two because of that. Yeah. Mm, okay. So the guy that I think I did see this with slightly is Jamie, because I think yes. Jamie had Emily slightly after the time I started. So right. I, I'm I'm sure that his wife Daisy was pregnant at the time when I started, mm-hmm. but he was probably coming at the tail end of him training more regularly and then obviously trying to get it all out of the system just like i did (laughs) so yeah i never actually got to see the version of chris that was training where i would regularly which is Mm -hmm. which is interesting to me because there's a whole class of upper belt that i've never seen and this is just my own career i haven't seen them not in their primes in terms of what they know, because obviously they know more now than they ever have, but in terms of just training regularly. So, yeah. So like Ryan yeah. Martman, Zach, these Ryan Lum France, but you, we know who we're talking about. It's like those guys, uh, even Tommy, like these are guys that, and, and Jamie and Victor Guzman, who now in Miami, Viet. Yeah. V- I mean, these are guys, so guys like Viet and Victor Guzman, obviously like I saw, it's funny. The week or so, like my first week there, I there's like, oh, we're having a get together because Viet's leaving, and I came. That was like the first time really? hanging out on the mats on a Saturday, and he had brought a couple handles, and he was saying goodbye, and I had just gotten there. So it's funny. Viet left, and I sort of came. We, the, we, we like his departure and my arrival are almost like. You so you're the, the uh, you're his walls hiking buddy spirit animal. I'm replaced. Yeah, I'm re- hopefully I replace some of that good karma that Viet brought. Yeah. You know, this brought you and I don't karma. deadlift before class, though. So <laughs> this is not yet. Maybe we'll start yeah, we through might start. That. Yeah, <laughs> cardio deadlifts. So Viet, still waiting for you. <laughs> so <laughs> my point is, it's I've heard stories about you know what a guy you know what Ryan went through. I've heard I've heard stories about you know. Ryan having guys, Jim has told me this, and that's another guy like Jim. I saw at the tail end of his journey too. Not that he's not, right. you know, fully capable of of training, but it's like it certainly seems like there is a push, and I, I totally get it to get belted up, especially for those guys that have black belt in their minds. Um, and guys like Zach and Tommy and and Ryan were certainly people that were were pushing to get to that and they were obviously training hard to get to that point. And then there's maybe some, a natural sort of re- relaxation and, or now other stuff in life becomes a priority in a way, because I was focusing so much of, you know, the last what, five, six, seven, eight, nine, whatever years, you know, getting to this thing. But I've never seen these people like at their peak, like you said, training. And it's fascinating to hear stories. And that's why your story of, you know, what brought you up to this point? You know, I've only seen a fraction of your journey. Yeah. I mean, and, yeah. and what kind of the, the part of this that I'm realizing was the catalyst to me asking you about this. And it's funny because I'm telling you now after the fact is I was, so this past weekend, you know, this, the audience might not know this, but the la- this past weekend, I was not training. I went out to Zion National Park out in Utah, and I went out with Victor and, and Paul. And this was sort of Victor's birthday present for turning 21 was to take him out to Zion and because he had tried to get out there two times before and he wasn't able to because of various uh, kind of hilarious circumstances. But, you know, bad luck, he couldn't get out there. So Paul's been out there before. I actually have not. I've, I've always wanted to be go out there. So the three of us went out there. Awesome time. Couldn't recommend it enough to people. However, the point of all this is, as always, 
we are grabbing dinner after a full day of hiking and we the beers are flowing paul orders a pitcher for himself because that's just how he is <laughs> but we're there chit-chatting and we end up talking about jujitsu which is weird because it's not something that just comes he up he typically doesn't talk about jujitsu right like no but i asked him cuz i was just it, i don't know it's just one of those things we're talking about stuff we're talking about mma and i said hey is it weird now that you you know over the past 5 years or so like you've given out a fair number of black belts you know i'm just thinking it's like here's a guy that you know he gave out to julian to cap at the beginning kind of thing and now he's got what, I guess what ten or twelve on the wall now in terms of you know that ultimately we have portraits. I'm talking about on the wall. We have yeah. we have portraits. You know we will have you know your portrait and Kali's coming up as well. That sort of thing. You know of the guys he's belted and I, and I'm just thinking it's like over the past five years. I'm just guessing you know like five years or so. It's like you belted up a, a chunk of them and before that you hadn't. Did is that like struck you? Is that weird? Is that odd? Like to think that suddenly you have like over 10 black belts under under you so to speak and what he said was was he said you know not really because all those guys and i say guys because they are they have been men thus far no women but they've all people i've known for a long time that were training with me at knockout fitness or at marcio's so he's like i've known them for a really long time so what's interesting is he hasn't gotten to another generation of oh yeah of people yet. So those yeah those people that got black belts in those 5 years as I understood and he can he can clarify this but my understanding is yeah that yeah just because over a 5 year period which for a lot of people is a long time you can get a guy like me can get a belt or two maybe in that time yeah. you know for People getting the black belt, some people got there early, some people got there in the middle, some people got there at the five, you know, year mark, but all those people come from the same cohort or the same group, so to speak, in a way, because they're a generation of of martial artists, of grapplers. And for him, it's just seeing those people get to the end of their journey, and it's not so odd. He hasn't that's how he views it, you know, and it made sense. So that's why I was curious because you're part of that generation. He brought that up in promotions. He said, you know, when, when you got promoted, who's the one that's been training here the longest? You know, everyone's looking around, you know, it's Chris. And Chris has been doing it for over 15 years. Yeah. And he goes back to knockout fitness. So I think it's really, it's really fascinating to take a step back and kind of look at the you know, the story, the narrative that's kind of played out, you know, and, and I think your journey in particular, just the fact that you guys had mats. I just love that story that's, where you guys, yeah, we were, where you're God, renting that's... out, you know, a room <laughs> and just, for, yeah. you know, business development. We're going to do a business development meeting for our, our just, club here at, at the university. It's funny because like back then tabletop gaming wasn't big, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, not nearly as big as it is now. And we'd be sitting there dragging this mat next, you know, to a room that's next to them. And I hear them, you know, you know, the, thus, thou, this, and whatever the fuck they do over there, rolling dice. And we're dragging this goofy wrestling mat next to each other and like slamming each other up against the walls and onto the mats. And just, it was just stupid. You see people walk by custodians because it's, you know, it's like seven, eight o'clock at night. You know, the campus is basically shut down at that point, except for, you know, the, the food court down in the bottom of the student union and, you know, janitors are going around to all the different boardrooms and cleaning th things up and they see us beating the shit out of each other, asking me who I am. I'm like, I'm oh, Chris Vu. Go look it up. I've got this room booked for PBL. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was, it was dumb, but it was fun. I mean, like, you know, it, it, there's something to the it idea. It sounds of, fun, man. It sounds like, it's it, not it smart. Sounds like, uh, well, I mean, at the, yeah, I chalk it up to youth, man. I mean, it it sounds fun, you know. Yeah, was it was optimal. Fun. No, but you got, but you got to, yeah, it was fun. How many people were in that group, do roughly? Like, I didn't get a good number. I, you said Andrew was involved. Like, how many people? Andrew on a given day were uh, roughly there. Probably about five or six of us. It was Andrew, five or six. me, Matt, my buddy Dan, who. <laughs> 
I think he did like three or four years of judo as a youth. So he was just fucking hip tossing the shit out of everybody. Uh, one of my Taekwondo buddies, Nami, he came a handful of times. Oh, man. It was, it was probably about five or six of us at any given time. And it was it was a lot of fun. I mean, like, I, I still, they're all my college buddies. Obviously, I talk to Angel the most, but I still keep in contact with everybody else. And everybody, I think I'm, I might be the only one who's still continuing martial arts. But, you know, Matt will still remind me to, to tell Jason Patino he teched him. <laughs> at like the 125 class or something which is hilarious because like you look at patino now and he's probably like a rock solid like 180 or something and uh oh my yeah God, man, that's was... crazy oh man now did it's you just... did did you guys bring any uh girlfriends or females <laughs> over to impress them with your no. with your no peacocking we, we were all single man we didn't have any girls <laughs> we're i mean these are guys who you know, me excluded, actually, all played fucking D&D together and just happened to enjoy martial arts and beating the shit out of their friends. We didn't have so any- these were the nerd assassins, as Eddie Brock yeah, called Yeah, the original nerd assassins. Yeah, these man. were not like, it wasn't like tough guys, you know, like, yo, bro, we, we, we scrap and then we go out to the bar with our cauliflower ear and no, tell the yeah, girls that we're they, fighters. Was, and stuff. We didn't drink even. I mean, I was the one who drank first uh, at all. We were... We were such nerds. We still are. It's it's funny. The nerd assassins, yeah, the, the first generation of nerd assassins. The OG. Well, that's nerd awesome. Assassins. Like the OGs. Yeah, that's awesome. Like, so is there? And this is the last. And 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 if you think this is too silly of a question, I I get it because I'm 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 reaching now at this question. But is there anything you would tell your 18 year old self or 19 year old self? that given what you know now like as advice to that person at that time as he's like exploring aliveness and all this stuff um maybe i should have stuck with wrestling i okay. did wrestle for two weeks in high school until i realized it was a just a time commitment that ate entirely too much into my schoolwork. And actually doing Taekwondo, incidentally. But but I appreciated the hard work then. I, maybe I should have stuck with that a little bit longer. Maybe, I, you know, honestly, maybe I saved myself some wear and tear on my joints and my back and my neck. And God knows what sort of like hormonal damage you're doing from weight cutting at a young age and that sort of thing. Who knows? But maybe I wouldn't be uh, such a guard fooler if I had wrestled a little bit longer than just the two months that i did i was gonna say yeah you wouldn't be this how do i do how do i exert the least amount of energy yeah you know i'd be a little and, more aggressive and, on the mats who knows maybe that's why i quit <laughs> wrestling and i just found that another excuse and I, it just wasn't for me who knows well jujitsu is an you know is a you're like you said jujitsu is a way to express your personality on the mats and the fact that you're not expressing as much wrestling is probably you know uh, an extension of your personality traits. So nothing. It's just, you are who you are. Yeah, exactly. And I'm, I'm happy where I am. I'm happy with the friends I've made. Uh, it's, you know, I, and just thinking back, just kind of looking at the question that you asked earlier about me and my journey. I don't, maybe it wasn't so much that I have an addictive personality, but all along, you know, we all look for our third place. We all look for our tribe. And, and that's what it's been all along. And martial arts just happens to be mine, regardless of whether it was a traditional martial art or me beating the fuck out of my friends and them smashing me with double leg takedowns and me breaking fingers and whatnot. And then now I found well, jujitsu and, you know, Muay Thai along the way. And, you know, like I, I, well, I, I definitely the, think that cheesy, I definitely but, think, yeah. no, no, I, I think, I think there's, I think this is what's powerful about, uh, you know about anything that that you can that a person can get wrapped up into like I, I i look at you and i consider you know you a lifelong martial artist and and i i kind of think i'm a pretty it's a pretty safe bet that i'm kind of in that category too even yeah, though i haven't been doing sure. it nearly as long as you but i think when people find something like that it really becomes uh 
a core facet of their personality and who they are and what what they need to be happy on a daily basis oh, yeah. so i think you know I, I you know i'm 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 reading just cursorily not intending to find this but i'm just finding so many parallels and so many positive benefits to to what you said not only having something having something that that you do that you love obviously is a positive thing but on top of that it brings the benefit of the fitness aspect that's great but on top of that it also brings the social aspect yeah, sure. where you actually bond with people and in a time where and this is kind of a reach i know and people might be weirded out that i'm going in this direction but the fact that you know we are in a way isolating ourselves more because of technology and the fact that we can you know, have shit delivered to our doorstep now, yeah, you know, you and the fact that we can, people we can right. text people instead of calling people and all these things add up to isolate people in a society more. And I've seen, like I said, not looking for it, that that kind of stuff can increase likelihoods of, of dealing with issues like depression, anxiety, all this stuff we do hear about. And the fact that you know, you myself have something that not only gives us the physical out, out, uh, outlet, but also a social outlet and being connected to a community, and of people that I, you know, I I think are really cool, interesting, insightful people from varying backgrounds, and we have this common bond, which is this weird love for jujitsu and kind of beating the shit out of each other, but not quite beating the shit out of each other, you know. And uh, you know, if anything, I, I'm just trying to say is, you know, jujitsu is awesome. If you're listening to this and you haven't trained jujitsu, I don't know why you're listening to the podcast, but try it out. <laughs> maybe they're into beer. <laughs> yeah, maybe they're into beer. Maybe they're like, how come these guys haven't talked about beer yet? <laughs> you know, um, on a side note, because I know it's getting late. We've talked for over an hour, so we'll, we'll wind this down. A uh, shout out to Michelle Sanchez. Oh, and my her, God. Congratulations, and congratulations to, her. to her and her husband, Axel. They uh, they got engaged and I think they, Is that his real I think they made it legal. Yes. So congratulations to both of them. Uh, many happy returns. We miss you, Michelle, on the mats. Hope you uh, get to training soon. I know she said to me that her gym in Connecticut is opening this week, and she will be. her plan is to get on the mats uh, next month, which is next week because we're almost in August. So I uh, hope that goes well. Hope you guys have an awesome time being married. I know you guys have been together for a long time, but... She's one of ours. I consider her a peer, and it's always good to, you know, good news from from people you train with, even if they're not at the gym. They're always part of the trial. Oh yeah, I like mean, like say. we. So. <laughs> yeah, she's mentioned probably more than existing students a lot of times, right? Like she made a good exactly. All, you know, absolutely, absolutely, and you know, maybe maybe that's a my not so subtle way of putting putting little feelers out there just to get her to come back at some point. You never know. <laughs> so, well, Chris, um, one last thing. I was curious. Did you see any of the UFC fights? I didn't. Past I was trying to catch up on the Benavides one. The Benavides card. So yeah, which before. was on one. Definitely want to check out this one. The, uh, the main card is entertaining. The last three fights or what I saw, and I got to see them live on ESPN out in Utah in the hotel room, and they were all awesome and crazy in their own way. Really? So I'll just leave it at that, yeah. I will definitely have to. Maybe I'll just skip the Benavidez one, you know? Well, I mean, there's tons of good stuff. And it's all, I, I mean, I've got ESPN Plus. I paid for a year. I can, I'm can. i stuck for 12 go. more months with it, right? There you go. Uh, Chris, do you have any other stuff you need to you want to share or say before we, we sign off with our like, subscribe, share, and all that oh, stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I did post a photo of my finger for those who were curious about the crookedness of a uh, what a, a, a popped ganglion cyst slash staph infection that goes inside can do. I did see that, and and you, I I don't remember the bend in your in that knuckle being quite so pronounced. Yeah, like, that's oh, uh, God, look at that thing. That's definitely it's bent, man. It, it does not straighten out without unless I even if I force it, it doesn't straighten out completely. That's how tight the uh, the bottom flexion tendon is. Uh, ligament is. Tendons connect muscles to bone, and ligaments connect bones to each other. So, dang. Okay, I learned something new. Yes. 
which is why I don't so, eat. Then your homework this uh, week. drumsticks from chicken. <laughs> Would you? Oh. I don't eat drumsticks on chicken because there's that l- there's always that weird little piece of tendon, man. That just that. Oh like, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, you, you know what I'm talking yeah. about on the like the quad part. I, of the, oh, I know, um, I know exactly what you're talking about. I know exactly. What you're talking it grosses about. me out. So I, I can't eat it. <laughs> so uh, your homework is find your Henzo Gracie. Book, yeah, man. Open it up. Take a picture of, of the, the crew page. Uh, there's only one page that I need to take a picture of. Okay, you know what it is, and upload it, mm-hmm. and that will be that will be on our social media. So, guys, our social media is BJJ and Brews. It's on uh, Facebook. It's on Instagram. YouTube. We have a Twitter account and YouTube. We have a Twitter account, but I always like to say we don't use Twitter. We just have Twitter. It's too political. We don't, man. We don't it. need to mess with that. Yeah, fuck, f- fuck Twitter. Fuck all that. <laughs> I'm just gonna leave it at that. Uh, but yeah, we have our YouTube channel. I'm a couple episodes behind with the with our YouTube episodes. So the if you want the absolute latest of BJJ and Brews, your best bet, your safest bet is to subscribe, whether it's Spotify, whether it's Apple, whether it's Google Podcasts, whether it's Stitcher, whether it's any of the platforms that are out there that you like to listen to your podcasts are. Give us a sub- subscribe, and that way the minute a new episode drops, you'll get it, and you'll be able to listen to this audio goodness. Leave a review if you can. All that good stuff. Like, subscribe, share. And if you want to email us, it's bjgmbrews at gmail.com. Anything I'm missing, Chris? I think I went over everything. Yeah, that was, uh, we got, I mean, there's so many outlets for social media nowadays. It's hard to even keep up with, right? Sure. I know. And, and I'm, I'm trying to think if there's more we can do with YouTube until we actually have a camera and videotape our podcast which is something i'm thinking about how we can manage to do that in the future um, it's still going to be just the audio version but i do know people already that that tell me they listen to stuff on youtube that's which, what i mean i i just leave it ambiently playing in the background at work you know like there you go so it's it, that it might be the it, for, the it media seems like choice. youtube is more readily available than than spotify oh, or, or yeah. apple like, po- for, which is weird because I, I don't know. I, I think it's not that hard to use one or the other. But yeah, but you don't just seem to like use for your phone. phone. Spotify doesn't have a very user friendly uh, interface for a PC, for example. Whereas I can just open up a Chrome mm-hmm. browser and YouTube's there. You know, this is true. So like that. That's why I prefer YouTube, at least at work. I mean, when I'm driving, I use Google Podcasts. But I'm I'm super mm-hmm. into that Google ecosystem. So uh, it's on Google Pod- Pod- Podcast too, folks. I think I yeah it's and in fact I, I keep fi- like every other week I find out that the podcast on another platform because not only do we have you know we've pushed it on as many platforms as we can there are other platforms that just pick up feeds because our feed is in a way public so hmm. I find out about other platforms that make it available so if you actually do a Google search for BJJ and Brews and maybe throw podcast in there you're gonna see all the platforms. And it's ridiculous how many there are. So whatever app you use, subscribe to the podcast using that app. And that way you'll never miss an episode and it'll help our numbers too, which is always fun. But the main thing is getting these episodes in your hands when they're ready. And I know people have been asking me like, oh, is there a new podcast out? And I'm like, well, if you subscribe, you'll, there's no way to exactly. there's no way to miss it. So you'll have to expl- explain to me the so, difference between that and an RSS feed later on. Uh, well, the RSS feed is technically what the you the you quote the URL is for the podcast. Hmm. That feed is what contains the the data that these uh, platforms are using to populate the art, the the link to the podcast because they they're not like we have our podcast hosted on a server. Okay, right. we use a platform called Anchor. Which you can also listen to it on Anchor, yeah, but then, they don't have the capability yeah. of subscribing. So that is where the physical audio resides. And the RS feed contains all the information for these platforms to know what the download, what the direct download link is for all the plat for all the episodes and what the the title is, what's the the description of it. And that's what they use, meaning Spotify, Apple, Google to populate oh. their interface in their, in their platform. So, so in essence, yeah. it's like, it's like, um, think of 
We have our hosting, which is where the podcast physically resides, you know, in space. And there are direct download links to all those episodes. And the RS feed is what contains all the information, like the footer notes or the liner notes, what used to be on, you know. And they choose to assemble that. Good at- it's the ingredients for the dish. And then each platform assembles that dish according to those ingredients, however they choose. Yeah. But the RS feed is standardized in the sense that everyone's agreed upon this is the format of it so you're just going to tell you what you know in there you can tell what episode it is what the title Mm. is what the description is and what the so i think the bare minimum is title description and in there's going to be the direct download link so that way when you hit play on your platform what's actually happening is it's going out to uh where it lives on our server and pulling it there. Or if you subscribe, chances are that platform, whenever it goes live, is going to download it for you already to your device so that whether or right. not you're connected to the internet, you can listen to the latest and greatest of BJJ. Okay. Because that I just think back to the early days of the different browsers. And then at one point, there was this little tab up at the top right hand corner of the cases that had RSS feeds on it. And I didn't understand mm-hmm. what that meant exactly. You know, so at the time, well, RS feeds can be used in in different contexts. So there's also an RS feed for websites where it's sort of like a distillation of the content on it. And it's generally for new sites so that you don't have to view the website in the format that the website's presenting it. You can view it through an RSS reader and have it formatted in a generic way, the way you like it mm, formatted. Okay. That's kind of the, it's the RS feed. I, I don't think people use RSS readers anymore. Yeah. I, I think, think, think it's so. kind of fallen out of favor, but that was kind of the rationale. I, I had one back in the day when it was like, like in vogue, so to speak. And what you would do is you would actually aggregate news from various websites into one feed <laughs> So in oh, essence, you would create your own web page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if, so in essence, you'd create a Reddit page in a way. It almost, it's yourself, almost like you're creating a, a Reddit, page Reddit page for yourself, yeah. a personalized Reddit page that's pulling from whatever website. So yahoo.com or Which, CNN, whatever. And yeah. in general, it was probably more concise. So I, I would like, I remember Lifehacker, which is still around, lifehacker.com. But back then, I, like I was into that or you could go to Gizmod. <laughs> and Jeez. Yeah, so in a way, you would you would be able to attach those RSS feeds into your reader, and in essence, create a tab that looks like basically, like you said, a Reddit feed. Honestly, Reddit kind of did it. I think that's what people. This what appears. If you go to Reddit, if you go to Reddit and you subscribe, it's not subscribe, but whatever the word is, let's say subscribe. Is, yeah. yeah, you join those the subs, the subreddits, right? The subs. Yeah. Thank you. Those subs. Well, if you go to your main page, it's going to mix all of them together based on time. And then you can sort and go to specific ones if you want. And that's essentially what you're doing. I want to aggregate news or data from multiple sources into one view. And RSS was a solution to that back in the day. But I don't think people. I don't really think so anymore. It. I mean, like, hell, my my phone just does that for me now. Right. Like, yeah, it's just that's that's the Google whatever. On the well, it's what I think is going to happen soon is, I don't know, you're not much of a PC gamer, are you? Used to be. I mean, I Diablo 2 it and so, Warcraft 3 did Okay. So you're familiar with Steam, right? Oh, yeah. Platform Steam. So I don't know how familiar you are, but they're now, mo- the major publishers all have their own version of Steam. Really? So you can play oh, their God. games on that it's platform. Like, it's just so, like so now you have Steam, right? you have electronic arts ea has origin uh ubisoft has you play epic has the epic game store uh bethesda has their own store i believe but now so things, it's just, now the next people thing are having to subscribe is, to all these different things how the fuck do you keep track of it all well that's the problem now your game library is, is across multiple platforms and you know drm digital rights management is still involved in that so it's not like you quote own the game and you can put it anywhere you own access that's that's why i buy game. blu-rays man Can't well yeah that away so from me. what exactly you have a physical copy so what ends up ha- except 
you know, people say, we'll go to, you know, GOG. GOG.com has their own platform and they give rights free games. So that's for the nerds out there talking about GOG. I'm aware of GOG. <laughs> but the point is, you have all these platforms that you can play your games on. So now your game library is no longer what it was in the past, which is you get a disc, you install it on your hard drive, and it's there. It's now digital downloads across multiple platforms. So it's going to be only a matter of time that there's going to be pressure. And I've already said, I've already seen it where that people are, there's going to be a software that unifies the library, your game libraries across all those platforms. So you have a single view that aggregates your library from origin, from steam, from the Epic game store, from GOG, because at the end of the day, what are those platforms doing? They're a list of games that you right, quote, right. own, and then you download them to your hard drive. And then that's the launcher, Blizzard, the other one. Of course, Blizzard has their own, you know, downloader, game launcher. So, yeah, Mad, right? it, yeah. so I want a list of all my games from all the platforms, and I want the ability to download and launch them from one place. That's going to happen if, if, if I'm sure it's already in the works, but I don't know if all those platforms like Origin and Epic Game Store and Steve's have APIs, have opened up enough of their technology so that someone can come along and create this own universal library. The reason being, they want you in their platform because that's how they sell games. To exactly. You. I mean, that's, that's part of those is a storefront. So the more time you spend in, you know, launching games from their platform means that's more time that they're going to see, ooh, Steam sale for this game buy it here that's how they make their money so bjj and bruce you know we were going to end what 20 minutes ago and now we we talked about digital rights management and rss fees because we also are nerds but hey we're an eclectic pair exactly and now i know so, what, what hey, that stupid tab for rss meant back in the day so. i know that's still in browsers but nobody but nobody uses uses. It anymore. <laughs> like at all so last question yeah. what come oh I have two questions. Two, yes. What comic? What what comic are you reading right now? So I just f- <laughs> said that I'm reading two. Um, I just finished okay. one. It was uh, the Vision by Tom King, okay. as uh, purchased for me by my best friend Andrew, that he highly recommended, and it was super heady. Let's just say very very. A lot more deep than I thought, than your typical superhero comic book. Let's, mm-hmm. um, he wrote a follow up in the DC universe called Mister Miracle, which I can definitely see the parallels uh, of the characters, which is also extremely heady, extremely emotionally draining to read. So I read, I finished reading the Vision. I'm now reading Mister Miracle in the daytimes only, but before I go to bed, I will sort of turn off my brain a little bit and read uh, right now I'm reading justice league of America power and glory written and drawn by Brian Hitch because it's just sort of like a summer blockbuster turn your brain off sort of thing. Nice. Yeah. It's, it's, it's good. You know, it's fun. It's big action. I mean, it's, it's good because I'm, if you know, I realize we're in August and we haven't really had any movies. No, because of COVID. Everything, man. It's pushed. I mean, it, I, I was know, supposed to have everything seen, got pushed back. Uh, yeah, I was supposed we to have had seen Black Wonder Widow. Woman we had Tenant. We had uh, James Bond. Like these are the movies I'm thinking of that I wanted to see. So, Wonder Woman 1984. So, yeah. Oh, that's true. That's the other one that would have come. So a lot of these movies, man, it, it's going to be everything's uh, been pushed down. It's going to be yeah. It's going to be it's, a it's going to be a tidal wave uh, of movies. Uh, we'll have a lot to watch in the next couple of years. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So in the meantime, mm-hmm. in between, because time. of streaming services, yeah. What is available, and I'm trying to think how I got exposed to this. It had to be... Was you going to say Old Guard just, right here? No. Oh. Uh, Cowboy Bebop. Cowboy Bebop. The fucking anime? Like the old anime? The anime, yes. Yeah. yeah. I haven't seen this, and I've heard it's amazing. Hmm. So I'm thinking about checking it out. Have you watched it? No, because like I kind of said before, the only animes I watch are ones that are martial arts or MMA related. All right. I'm going to watch that. That's what I want to watch while I have dinner tonight. And I will report back to you. Nice. Let me know how it is is because I've heard, I've heard it's highly influential in terms of 
like stuff that's come after it. Really? So, and I've, I've, yeah. Okay. Oh, you know how I saw it? I saw it because of an honest trailer. That's what I saw. They did an honest trailer on it, and I was like, "Man, this looks really good." And then I looked it up, and it was just like universal acclaim. Hmm. So when I see something that has universal acclaim, and I got exposed to it through the honest trailer, so I saw clips of it, and I was like, "This looks, this looks really cool." It, so I'm not. I have never really watched any anime. I only dabbled a little bit in Dragon Ball Z, and I don't really consider that. I mean, it is anime, but it's not what I think anime has really become, which is this genre of well that's the problem you're you're saying anime right like just like comics are a medium not a genre anime is a medium not a genre to me it's an artistic style that's it like that's that's how i okay that's that's a fair way of putting it you know it's like that's and just because an artistic style doesn't mean there's not a whole there's only one type of story that they're going to tell they're going to tell a whole bunch of different types of stories and appeal to a whole bunch of i did see akira when i was when oh, i was way too young yeah that's <laughs> and i don't <laughs> and i just remember like man this is a cartoon that you can see you know like a little nudity and blood but that's all it yeah. was because i was kind of young make any sense it. of that fucking storyline i didn't no i think i, I saw it when i was like 16 either. i was like what the fuck is happening <laughs> like what is going on here so yeah <laughs> So anyway, Cowboy Bebop, I will check that out and report back to you. Yeah, I'm going to finish uh, watching Chris, Bucky too. So, Oh, Buck, there you go. Yeah. So, Chris, um, thanks again for making the yeah. time. Uh, guys, every week we try to drop episodes. It's our pleasure. Like, subscribe, share. We will catch you down the road for the next one. Have a great one.